Well, let's begin. This is our last class meeting of the semester. You successfully made it through all of our online lectures. This is class 38. Um, you know, in a normal semester, we would have had a few more lectures, but because of the um, the week of suspended classes that we had, and then actually about a year ago, the university went to um, a one week shorter semester to begin with. So we're just only getting 38 classes this semester in a normal um, three meetings per week class. There would have been 45 previously. So uh, we're not getting as much time on the topic as we would have liked, but maybe with all the circumstances it's as much as we could handle. Let's take a look at the announcements. Um, homework 13, which includes a couple of problems that I think will be addressed by today's in-class activity. That assignment be, should be submitted tonight by 11.59 p.m. So I wanted to give you a little bit extra time to work on it because we're going to cover cost capacity, factor method, activity-based costing, and none of these ideas are particularly complex. And of course, you can always read your textbook and figure them out without me telling you about it. But all the same, I wanted to give you a little bit of extra time, so uh, you should submit the assignment by this evening at 11.59 p.m. Then you won't hear from me for a week because our final exam isn't until Friday of next week. Um, so actually, uh, seven days from now, you'll just be winding down our final exam because it needs to be submitted on Blackboard by 12.15 p.m. So it's a two-hour test, and I previously, uh, in our uh, previous lecture I gave you some of the details about that. The format's going to be largely similar to what we had for the previous midterm exam where uh, you know you're allowed to use your previous assignments, the in-class exercises, you can consult your notes and the textbook, but what you can't do and what you shouldn't do is communicate in any way with another person during the exam. So what you submit is exclusively your own work. So that exam will be a week from today uh, are there any questions related to the announcements before we start talking about the final tools and the cost estimation uh, tool belt? All right. Well, if anything does pop up, you can send me a message by email. I'll continue to be checking that on a daily basis between now and our final exam. So if you do have any questions, please just let me know. All right. If you've ever flown over America in an airplane, you've probably looked down from the plane window and seen something similar to this. And uh, if you aren't a civil engineer or if you haven't taken an environmental engineering class, maybe you're not exactly sure what it is. It looks like a, a series of adjacent swimming pools, maybe. But it's definitely not swimming pools. Uh, these are wastewater treatment plants. And so what we're specifically looking at in this picture is uh, on the left, these are aeration basins, which is used to try and stimulate the growth of bacteria in wastewater so that those bacteria break down pollutants that's in the wastewater. So these are aeration basins, and these are clarifiers. So I'm showing you a picture of this wastewater treatment plant to contrast with a smaller wastewater treatment plant. So you can see the picture on the top has a lot of aerators and many different clarifiers and more than 10 clarifiers, whereas this um, smaller scale wastewater treatment plant looks like they've only got five clarifiers um, for the primary treatment and then this might be some sort of a polishing clarifier off to the side. So think about the cost of construction. And there's a general trend that you'll notice if you go to Lowe's that the more you buy sometimes you'll get a contractor discount so if you buy for instance uh, 12 uh, electrical outlets then they'll charge a lower price than if you're just gonna walk into Lowe's and buy a single electrical outlet to install or replace in your house so that idea of a bulk discount is true in a lot of things you know for example it's cheaper to buy on a per pound basis a pound of wheat is going to cost less if you buy it by the rail car than if you buy it by the three pound bag available for purchase at Dollar General. So there's a bulk discount. And we need to account for these differences in cost associated with the size of the item 
and the quantity of its underlying materials being purchased. And this cost estimating relationship called the cost capacity equation enables us to do that. And so the cost capacity equation uses known price data at one size in order to extrapolate an estimated price at a different size. And so here in this formula, what we're talking about as Q, this variable Q is just an amount of something. So it might be, for instance, the, uh, the size of a machine and you know, how many units per hour it's able to produce. So that if you wanted to predict the cost of a machine that can do more units per hour, you'd use a ratio of the size, the, pr the one you're trying to predict size, compared to the one that you have cost data for. So Q is a measure of size of the item or its capacity. And then C1 is the cost of the item that you do have data for. C2 is what you're trying to predict. Now there's one last component to this equation and it's the correlating exponent. And not all relationships are linear. So sometimes the bigger it gets, you get uh, a linear relationship between the increased size and the increased cost, but sometimes it's not linear. So we'll look at a table of these correlating exponents in just a moment. But the general trend is that if you have an x value that's smaller than 1, then that gives you an economy of scale. An economy of scale means that there's an advantage for having the, uh, the larger item. That on a per unit basis it's getting increasingly cheaper for that added quantity and if it's less than one then that means there's a diseconomy of scale so for whatever reason sometimes if you make a bigger thing it's getting more and more expensive on a per unit basis now of course it's getting more expensive on an absolute basis but it can also be getting more expensive on a per unit basis so just as an illustration of how we can use this equation, let's take the example of a wastewater treatment plant that we have cost data for. And the treatment plant that we have cost data for is able to um, treat 0.5 million gallons per day. That's what that unit MGD stands for, is it's half a million gallons per day. And to build that treatment plant, we spent $1.7 million. Now, uh, the correlating exponent for this water treatment plant is 0.14. So that just means that um, we're having an economy of scale. So if you double the, the size of the treatment plant, that means it's, going, it's not going to double the cost. It's going to be less than double the cost in order to double the size. If the correlating exponent was 1, then that would mean double the size gives you double the cost. But here... Um, doubling the size doesn't double the cost. And so what we're going to do in, is try and predict the cost of a plant that has a size of 2 million gallons per day. So in fact, what we're doing here is we're going from the cost data we have for the half million gallon plant, and we're trying to extrapolate what should the cost be for a plant that is four times the capacity. All right, so let me show you uh, the calculations on this because this is just an illustration that I want to share with you and alright so we have a half million gallon per day plant that we know costs 1.7 million dollars and the correlating exponent for this type of equipment is 0 0.14 so if we're trying to find out how much is the cost for a flow capacity of 2 million gallons per day then we're going to make the substitution into our equation. So you can see it's the 1.7 million. The ratio of the size is 2 to 0 0.5. So this plant that we're trying to predict the price for is four times the cost. So if you didn't know any better, you'd say, well, it's going to be four times as big. Maybe it should cost four times as much. But the correlating exponent tells us otherwise. The correlating exponent tells us that, in fact, increasing the size of the item, in this case, is only going to increase the cost by a factor of 1.214. Because that is the size ratio to the power of the correlating exponent. And so this 
treatment plant will cost $2.06 million. So you're getting a plant that's four times the size for just a little bit more money because that correlating exponent is so much lower than one. Any questions so far on this idea of how to extrapolate cost data on the basis of size? Any questions at all? Here is some data for different types of things in wastewater treatment. And so you'll notice that a lot of these things have correlating exponents of less than one. And so anytime the correlating exponent is less than one, what you can think of is you're getting, in essence, a bulk discount. That you're making it larger, but the cost increase is slower than the size increase. But there are a handful of things for which the correlating exponent is greater than one. Look here, for instance, the aerated lagoon. For the aerated lagoon, the, the exponent is 1.13. So that means that if you were going to double the size of an aerated lagoon, the cost would go up by more than double because of that correlating exponent being greater than 1. Okay. Now, um, another way to predict costs of something that you, you don't know exactly how much it's going to cost, but you know the, the cost of something else. Maybe you know uh, one component of a system. We can use the factor method to predict the overall cost of a project by knowing the cost of just one component of the project. And one example I like to give is that um, when I used to live in Dubai, you could kind of get a feel for how expensive a meal would be by just looking at the cost of a bottle of water. And you didn't have to look at the whole menu. If you just look at the, the cost of a bottle of water, you may go into one restaurant and they're charging three dirhams for a bottle of water. Three dirhams is uh, less than, it's about 85 cents. So. If the, uh, if the bottle of water is 85 cents, then you can say that the meal is going to be about $8.50. So I, just, I came to expect that the overall cost of the meal was about 10 times the cost of how much the water was going to be. So that if I sat down in a restaurant and suddenly I notice on the menu that they want 20 dirhams for a water, then I stand up and walk away because that means that the meal itself is going to be so expensive because I can predict the overall cost by understanding the cost of a single component. So that's what the factor method does. All right, so what we're going to look at is uh, I sent you the in-class exercise for today via email shortly before this lecture began. And uh, let's start with applying the cost capacity approach. Now, this is the combination of what we've just learned about cost capacity and then also cost index. So you can get a little bit more practice with that. So you'll notice here the equation that I've supplied combines the cost capacity component. So here's what we've just talked about, about you know, predicting cost on the basis of size. But then it may also be that the cost data you have for item one came from the past. And now, many years later, prices have changed because of inflation. So that's what the second part of this equation is handling. This ratio of the cost index data is enabling us to correct for inflation and changes of expense over time. All right, so overall, we have in this example, we, we know that back in 2010, we have some cost data for a small treatment plant. This relatively small treatment plant, for instance, it had a two million gallon per day aerated lagoon. And we're going to try and use its cost data of $3.3 million to figure out how much will a larger system cost that has a 5.5 million gallon per day aerated lagoon. So we've got two corrections to make. We've got the correction for size and then also the cor correction for the passage of time because back in 2010, when we obtained this cost data, the construction cost index was 137. So that would be our I naught down in this equation. And then the, uh, 
the construction cost index nowadays is 100, well, nowadays being 2017, the construction cost index is 164. So let's do this for all three components and then find out the total system cost because there's going to be the aerated lagoon part of the cost, the blower part of the cost, and then the pump part of the cost. And each one of them is going to have a different x value. The x value that you'll need for each of them can be obtained on this table. So we have, let's see, aerated lagoon, blower, and pump. So if you've printed this off, you can circle the aerated lagoon. Let's see, lagoon aerated. So that has a 1.13 and a blower 0 0.46. And then there was also a pump, right? Is that the other one? Pump, centrifugal pump. All right, and so 0 0.69 is the X for that. If you didn't print this off, of course, you can do the calculations on just a scratch piece of paper. You don't have to have it printed. I'll leave it up on the screen while we pause for a moment. I'll stop talking, give you a chance to do your calculations and focus. Um, find the cost for each one of these components with a larger system. So this will be the Q2 when we want to find the aerated lagoon. This will be the Q2 for the blower. This will be the Q2 for the pump. And then in each case, we're also using this cost index data. All right, crunch the numbers. All right, so first of all, if we want to predict the cost of the blower, excuse me, the aerated lagoon. The aerated lagoon is the component that I have up. So you'll notice that I've identified the variables. You know, the, the existing cost data I have is for the 2MGD aerated lagoon, and I want to find out how much would an aerated lagoon cost with a capacity of 5.5 MGD. So our size ratio is going to be 5.5 to 2. So it's going to be larger uh, than the existing system. And then we actually have a non, um, I guess it's uh, getting progressively more expensive. So it's a, uh, what do we call that? In the notes here, a dis economy of scale. So for this, aerated lagoon, we have a diseconomy of scale because as you make it larger, the unit cost is increasing. And then we also have the uh, cost index factor. So the old aerated lagoon costs 3.3 million. This new aerated lagoon that's going to be built, we project will cost uh, 12.47 million. And so we can apply that same technique for the blower and the pump as well. So looking at the blower, you can see that uh, the blower has an economy of scale because the correlating exponent is less than one. So using the old cost data and the old time of the cost data, we update it for the larger size and for the date when prices are higher, and we think that the blower is going to cost uh, $734,000. And then the same approach with the pump. So if we have the, the cost of each of the individual components, the lagoon, the blower, the pump, and add it all together, then this system we expect is going to cost about $13.5 million. Does anybody have questions related to how you apply the uh, cost capacity equations? 
All right, well then let's look at the second part of the in-class exercise that I sent to you before class. This is where we're gonna apply the idea of the factor method. So the factor method is what I was mentioning before where you can project the cost of a meal by understanding what is the cost of one component of that meal. So here, what we're trying to do is put a generator into service, an electrical generator. So uh, what we have is we know the cost of the main component. We know that the generator is 975,000. That's like good specific cost data what we have. What we also know is that usually from past data, what we found in the past is that the concrete pad that the generator is installed on top of, that that's usually 39% of the cost of the generator. So just in the past we've averaged out, you know, when it was a small generator, it didn't need as big a concrete pad. When it's a bigger generator, it needs a larger one. And just it seems like most of the time, the concrete costs about 39% of the generator. And likewise, we know that operator training is about 16% of the cost of the generator. Now there's one other thing that we're gonna add into that, this, and it's the indirect cost factor. So let's talk about indirect costs briefly. Um, in this equation, it takes into account not only the direct costs, but also the indirect costs. And indirect costs are those things that can't be directly tied to a uh, level of productivity. So for instance, in the example that we've talked about a couple of times, of if you're operating a factory that makes Twinkies, then the direct costs are those things that are uh, directly tied to how many that you're making. So, you know, how much plastic you use for the wrappers is directly tied to how many Twinkies you're generating. And the amount of flour in pounds, the amount of sugar in pounds, that all goes into direct costs. But indirect costs are the accounting, the supervisor salaries, administrative costs that aren't necessarily directly tied to the, uh, the cost of uh, the level of productivity. So in this in-class exercise, what we know is the cost of a major piece of equipment. So the C sub E is the cost of the diesel generator. And then the one in this equation, this one refers to the cost of the generator itself. And then all of the other direct cost factors, like the cost factor of the concrete pad, the cost factor of the um, training, those are the direct cost factors and so then brackets around all of that so all of that you find in amount and then you recover the indirect costs by one plus the indirect cost factor outside of that bracketed quantity so going back to our example what we know is the indirect cost factor it's going to be in the outside of the the bracket uh, 0.27 so find the total cost of putting the generator into service using this formula. I wish I'd pasted that in. Do I have it at the bottom of the page maybe? No. Well, I'll put it on the screen so that it's handy to you. Here's the equation and we're going to use the cost data from this problem. If you've got your calculator handy, you can start crunching the numbers. All right, so we've got uh, two direct cost factors. We have the direct cost factor of 0.39. That's going to be one of the direct cost factors. And then another one, 0.16. So add those two together along with one. 
multiply that by the cost of the generator and then all of that together is going to get multiplied by 1.27 for the indirect cost. So if we just look at the solution to this one. What I hope you got if you were following along and I hope you're following along with your calculator is that this generator, the total cost of putting it into service would be 1.7 million. Excuse me, that's 1.9 million. Okay, so you can see how the direct costs are compounded by the indirect costs and then we get the total overall cost of the project from that. Any questions about this example? Um, there is the need to allocate indirect costs. And uh, remember that indirect costs are hard to uh, figure out where they should be recovered. So if you operate a company and you have to spend a certain amount on your accounting and supervisor salaries, like how do you pass those expenses along to the customer is sometimes the question. So how to account for and recover indirect costs. Um, so there's, in this table, some different types of indirect costs that come up. So for instance, if your company has to pay property taxes, then the textbook suggests that one way you can figure out which projects to assign those indirect costs to is on the basis of how much space is occupied. So if you have a factory that's making two different things, and uh, one of the things that's made in the factory takes a lot of the square footage of the warehouse. But then the other thing uses hardly any square footage. <clears throat> it wouldn't be fair to try and recover the property taxes just 50-50 between those two projects. It would make more sense to transfer some of the taxes, the property taxes that have to be paid, and try and recover uh, by building in some of the uh, cost on the material that used as more space. So each one of these has suggestions on how you can allocate the costs that are incurred to the item that's being generated and how you pass along certain expenses to your customers. And you actually see this in the real world quite a lot. Um, if you've ever shipped something by UPS, um, then you may look and notice on the receipt that they're charging something called a fuel surcharge. And so that was their decision to pass along expenses for high fuel prices back when fuel prices were a lot higher than they are now. Uh, you probably remember, and I certainly do, paying as much as like $4.50 a gallon for gas. I went to Washington DC a couple of years ago, and maybe eight or nine years ago I went to DC and paid 450 a gallon and now you can get gasoline for a dollar fifty a gallon it's remarkable but um, the point of that is just that indirect costs have to be reallocated to the things where those costs were generated uh, and so here is the uh, the accompanying in-class exercise there on the paper that I gave you um, we're going to look at a company that has three different subdivisions. It's a construction company, but they have um, a, a subcomponent that is in the business of excavation. They have a steel assembly sub affiliate, and then they have a surveying division. And so, if you look and try and understand, you know, this main overall construction company and its uh, like sub brands. The excavation company seems to be the largest of them on the basis of revenue. So you'll notice that they're getting a lot of money coming in for their excavation company. It has only 18 employees though compared to the steel assembly company. The steel assembly company has 43 employees, smaller revenues. 
And then uh, you'll see how many active projects each one of them has. So the purpose of this exercise is just to ask the question, if there were indirect costs of $6.95 million, so the indirect costs are the things like property tax, electricity costs, you know, all of the things that aren't necessarily directly tied to how much work each one of these sub companies is doing, we've got to figure out how to spread that between these three companies. $6.9 million in indirect costs have to be recovered, so should you just divide it by three? and make each subdivision pay a third? Well, it seems like that maybe wouldn't be fair because, for example, the surveying division is so small. It only has seven employees and it has the smallest base revenue. And so they wouldn't be able to cover a third of these indirect costs. So in A through D, what I'm doing is I'm suggesting a way for us to analyze this a couple of different ways. In step A, you're going to look at what if the $6.9 million is recovered on the basis of base revenue. So it's proportional. It's prorated on the basis of the base revenue. So what you'll need to do is add up and find what's the total base revenue for the whole company. And then what is the percentage each subdivision is contributing to the base revenue. And so that percentage is then what you apply to find out how much of the indirect costs each subcomponent should pay. So that's our approach for part A. And in part B, what we're saying is now, how are you going to pass that along to the customers? The excavation company, they measure their productivity on the basis of um, the volume, the cubic meters of soil that's excavated whereas the steel assembly affiliate, their measure of productivity isn't on the basis of excavation, it's how much length of reinforcing steel they assemble out in the field. So you know, if, if we find in part A how much that they're gonna have to pass along to their customers, what I'm asking you to do in A, B, excuse me, in B, C, and D is find out what surcharge will go to each one of the customers. Okay, so let me pause for a moment, give you some time to digest this problem, begin your calculations, and then of course in about um, five or six minutes, I'll jump back in and we'll look at the solution together. And by the way, this will be on the test. <laughs> this is still fair game for the final exam. All right, so how are we going to pass along this $6.95 million to our customers? That is the question. All right, so our total revenue, if we add it all up, is $17.5 million. That's how much the three divisions together are bringing in. And uh, if you find out how much each of them should be expected to chip in for the covering the indirect cost, we have to recover $6.9 million in total. And so the excavation company is going to cover the majority of that. Because if you look, the excavation company has the majority of the base revenue. So we're going to have the excavation company cover $5.4 million. The steel affiliate will cover about a million, and then the surveying division, $554,000. That's how much each of them has to cover. Now, as to how we're going to pass it along, Part B is asking, um, all right, well, if the excavation company is measuring their activity on the basis of volume, 180,000 cubic meters in a year, then what we will do is have them pass along $29.92. They're going to add that to each cubic meter of uh, excavation they do. So on top of their base rates that they charge their customers, they're going to have to add an additional 29 at $29.92 to cover the indirect costs. And then a similar approach, 
For the steel assembly, where their proportion of the indirect costs are divided by the length of steel that they're assembling, so that works out to $17.57. And then for the uh, surveying division, what we want to do is we want to find out if it's just going to be a percentage. So we know that their current um, revenue is $1.4 million, and so we want to know what is the uh, $554,511 as a fraction of the base revenue. I think actually this formula is more complicated than it needs to be. If you just divide, let's see, if we just divide 554,000, so 554, 511, divided by the base revenue of 1.4 million, it's that same 39.6. So I don't know why I went to the trouble of, I mean, this would represent the base revenue and this represents the indirect, but to calculate the percentage, we could just divide one by the other. All right. So that is how we handle uh, indirect cost allocation. The last thing we're going to talk about, activity-based costing, it's just understanding that um, different uh, expenses associated with operations are driven by the activity of those operations. And so um, since we're low on time, I'm just going to go straight to the solution for this last question on the in-class exercise so you can see what activity-based costing looks like. So let's take, for instance, if we had three different um, divisions inside of a college. If we had an engineering division, a computer science division, and a safety technology division. And you can see that we have the characteristics of each of them up on the screen, like the number of faculty, how many students each one of them has. Well. What if this college had to pay $145,000 a year to the IT department? That's kind of like their share of covering the IT department's expenses. So the question in activity-based costing is, uh, how do we allocate that expense? And the way that we do it could vary based on you know, what's driving the cost. So of the 145000 is that cost driven by support calls? Is it driven by the number of computers that's owned by each division or the number of students? And you can make an argument that, uh, you know, if you are the computer science division, then what what's best for you is to say, well, I'd like the indirect costs to be recovered on the basis of support calls because I guess these people being good with computers, they don't have very many support calls in a week. So if they had to just pay their share on the basis of support calls, they'd be getting off easy. But then on the other hand, if you were to allocate these costs on the basis of how many faculty members are in this division, the safety technology maybe would want you to use faculty because that's their lowest number. So um, if we just look at the different implications of using the different methods for recovering the indirect costs, then if we were going to try and recover the cost on the basis of support calls, then you'll see that engineering is going to pay 5 thirteenths because they have 5 support calls per week out of 13. And so like their fair share if it was the support calls that are driving the cost would be the $55,000 per year. And you can see for the safety and computer science how much their proportional contribution would be. But if, it's, if the costs are really about how many computers there are, then there's a different way of looking at it. Now suddenly the computer science folks go from having to only pay $22,000 a year for their share up to $65,000 per year because they have so many computers. So what you'd need to do is you need to check with the IT department and find out like uh, what do they spend most of their time doing? Do they spend most of their time interacting with people during support calls or are the costs really related to maintaining the equipment itself and it's not so much about the people? And uh, this just illustrates that there's a wide variation in the allocation of costs depending on the basis for uh, applying them. And maybe a middle approach is if you look at the number of students in each of the divisions. And so that's the concept of activity-based costing. And I think that you have a homework problem where that kind of idea ties in.
All right, well, it's 12.50 p.m. We're out of time. I'm going to ask you, if you haven't already, please fill out the uh, survey, you know, the, uh, the survey of uh, the course evaluation where you get to talk about the course. And if you have any feedback on how the class could be improved, I'd be uh, grateful to receive it. Remember that the homework assignment is due tonight by 11.59, and then next Friday is when we have our final. So if you have any questions, get in touch, send me an email, or give me a call. I hope you uh, have a great weekend. Thanks for your attention and your effort this semester. I really appreciate that. So uh, you'll hear from me for the final. Take care. Bye-bye.